Revivals are most likely when they're least likely. When you think you're the first, revivals never come where the Christians feel they have the high ground in a nation. It always comes in the backdrop. Revivals have come when socialists have, have been in charge, dictators, uh, uh, persecuting monarchs, on and on and on, that many times what we think it takes to have revival is completely different than what God takes. So let me give you an example. Years ago, before I happened to be on staff with Lou Cheon, Larry Randolph was there at Harvest Rock Church. I was finishing a stint in campus ministry. I directed and planted campus ministry for 10 years. I was at that time what was called the number one party school in America. This story is everything to do with what I believe God is saying. I would usually kind of start off the year because we'd get a lot of visitors. I'd start off the year with kind of this street apologetics. It's Holy Ghost, but kind of like a commoner's approach to how to defend your faith because we're on the number one party school in America. More alcohol is consumed per capita at this university than any other university, largely because of one week that would send us over the mark. They called it Wild Week or Pioneer Week. And all of a sudden, as I'm preaching, okay, picture this, I'm at BMU 222. And as I'm at BMU 222, which Acts 222 speaks of how God endorsed Jesus with signs, wonders, and miracles, which he did in your midst and you yourself know. All of a sudden, as I'm speaking, kind of like I'm speaking right now, over to my left, there's an older guy that I can tell you're not a college student. And bless your heart, I'm glad you came out to our meeting. But I don't even think you're a professor. You're just a little old to be in our, in our meeting. But that's cool. I'm an evangelist. I want everybody to hear the gospel. And all of a sudden... It sounded like he began to growl. And I thought, that's an odd sound. You know, you usually get an amen, come on, preach that. I was in a church where a sister threw her shoe at me. But I'm, I'm not used to somebody growling while I'm preaching. And again, I'm trying to do this little talk on apologetics. All of a sudden, this adverse wind of a growl became full-blown. This guy is starting to cuss. He's starting to cuss me out which I grew up in inner city Oakland. He's inventing cuss words I never heard before riding on the back of the 57 bus. So he's really cussing and he's cursing me, but he's, he's not doing it so loud to take over the entire meeting, but he's doing loud enough where I'm kind of being distracted. So I got this quandary. I've got this conundrum. I'm trying to declare the word, but I've got some opposition going on. Y'all with me? I got an adversary. Well, I have been witnessing to this football player and the football player shows up in this meeting and I'm going oh my god I finally get this guy I've been witnessing to to show up and he's at the meeting where this dude is cussing me out right and so unbeknownst to me the distraction of this storm this is an adverse kind of wind that quickly became a grade five tsunami now follow me I'm starting to shift into the simple gospel it was probably by default. It's probably this thing of I had all these notes and stuff that I wanted to talk about. In the moment of attack, I went back to the simple gospel message, believing for the supernatural Jesus to show up and show off. And then all of a sudden, this dude stands up. And I know what you think I'm going to say. He stood up and went out. No, he did. He, and, and he came up right in front of me and was cussing me out while I'm talking. So imagine a person standing right here. I'm telling you about Jesus. This dude's cussing me out. But at the same time, the football player that I've been ministering to walks up side by side. He starts weeping. Now, why did I tell you that story? Quickly. Amen. And he gives his life to Christ. The Lord reminded me that you can have persecution and revival side by side. That you can have adversarial uh, accusations and have awakening at the same time. That many times we don't realize it. Now here's quickly what I'm going to tell you because my bride is going to get up and she's going to drop some bombs. Acts 27, I just want to give you three points. I'm convinced that there's a storm. 2020 has been about storms. And I know that, that we're a room of prophetic people. But if I could politely submit this to you, I don't know if anybody saw all of this coming, okay? I know some people out there that's kind of mad at the prophetic people, kind of like, how come you didn't give us a warning? How come, you know, you didn't give us an alert? But as I was talking to a mentor of mine, 
we wanted a warning and alert for COVID, but maybe COVID is a warning and alert for what God wants to do. Maybe the big event when 2020 is over is not about the germ, the Rona Begona. Come on, maybe at the end of this year, unbeknownst to us, while we're concentrating on the adversarial wind that became a grade five tsunami, maybe there's an entire harvest that's getting ready to give their life to Christ if we will give them Jesus. There are certain storms you rebuke, Mark 4. There are certain storms that get you where God wants you to go. You want to rebuke them, but they're going to stay in place till you redirect. Acts 27, Paul's trying to get to Rome. All of a sudden, an adverse wind becomes a full-fledged storm. And as a result of that, they have to redirect. I am convinced, and I want to give you these three quick points that I believe will help you. This storm, these are three things God gave me last night. This storm is for your redirect. This pandemic, this pandemonium, this polarization, and this, this mess at the polls, we'll stick with all peace. I believe that we want to get back to normal, but God allowed this so we would be delivered from what we thought was normal because what we thought was normal wasn't normal. It was abnormal. It was subnormal. Jesus wants to show us up and show us what real normal looks like. It looks like revival. It looks like Jesus walking in the earth. I believe that this thing is about a pivot. I believe this thing is about the church getting outside the four walls. I believe this thing is about seeing ourselves as the solution center to the madness that's going on out there. And as a solution, follow me, you don't have the privilege to complain about the problem because you're meant to be the remedy to the problem that's taking place all around us. Come on, you guys are woke up. I love that. This storm is for your redirect. I'm convinced that the cry of Evan Roberts must be our cry now. It's been, been, been the church saved the world. If this were, if there was a modern uh, interpretation of that, is Lord caused us to pivot that we could be peacemakers, not peacekeepers, not peacekeepers, not peace at any cost, but that which makes for lasting peace. Number one, I tell you, this storm is about your redirect. Number two, this storm is about you throwing some stuff overboard, right? When that storm came, they start recognizing we're not going to make it. And so people start throwing over their taco boxes. They, they start throwing over whatever they have, right? And, and here's what I feel like the Lord woke me up last night. I don't see that very often. My wife has said, but he literally, actually, he didn't let me go to sleep till like 4.30 in the morning, all right? Felt like the Lord said this to me, no more partial priest. You know, the priest, the priest in the Old Testament had 12 stones representing all the tribes. Even at a certain time when north was against south in terms of the nation of Israel, and there was a moment there where there were some skirmishes and almost a civil war, I would imagine the priests didn't take off half their stones and represent the north, and the other priests represented the south and only had six stones on their chest. I felt like the Lord says, no more partial stone priest that we want to have the stone on our chest for those that stand for the national anthem, but we want to have a stone on our chest for those that kneel for the national anthem. We want to have a stone on our chest for people on the far right, but we better have a stone on our chest for people on the far left. We have to have a stone. You can't be a partial stone priest. You got to be a 12 stone priest representing a nation. You don't have the luxury of wearing half the stones. Come on, somebody. I want, this, I want Nancy Pelosi to get saved. Come on, somebody. Can you imagine if not you, but certain Christians and begin North American Christians, those of you that are in other nations watching, certain North American Christians that have demonized people. And see, when you demonize people, you fight against those you should be trying to free. Instead of trying to fight, you should be trying to free. Come on, somebody. I want Kamala Harris to get saved. I want her to be baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost. And one of the things that this pandemonium is doing, and even the delayed election, and, and amen, I, I, I want my right 
guy presiding in the White House. But more importantly, I want the right God presiding in the church. I want the demeanor of the Father to rule and reign in our hearts. I want there to be a clear example of what Jesus' love looks like, that's willing to cross the aisle. That's the church Jesus died and bled for. This storm is about throwing certain things overboard, but I'd also include in, in this second point, it's about clinging to the precious. While everyone else is reeling on the deck, Paul is kneeling in the bottom of the boat, and he has an encounter with an angel. I feel like the Lord says, in the midst of this storm, God has given encounters for those of us that will focus our heart and say, Jesus, I want you. I want you more than anything else, that I'm not moved by the storm. Come on, somebody. I'm not moved by the storm. Why? Because Paul had a word. He's going to Rome. He's not going to go down because of a storm, right? The storm is speaking to us, but Rome is speaking to us. Come on, somebody. Later on, he get bit by a snake. The venom speaking to him, but Rome still. Your destiny must be louder than your circumstance. Final thing, because I've gone a little bit over. Sorry, boo. Number three, the final thing about this storm this storm is about creating a miracle out of you. And I'll close with this. Christy, get ready. This storm is about creating a miracle out of you. Because of the storm, there was a redirect. And instead of going straightly, straight ways to uh, Rome, they were forced to go to Malta, which Malta Norma means honey. But here's what happens in Malta. You get to the, barely get to the shore. A snake bites you. You shake it off. Right, everybody's expecting you to die. It's the revival that turns cynics into converts. All them people looking at Paul, expecting him to swell up and die, instead saw a man shake it off. They end up bringing him to the guy, Publius, who's the head guy of the entire island, and a revival breaks out. And this can almost break me. I mean, I did some, you can fact check this, meaning you could Google it. To this day, Malta is 95.2% Christian. It has less, I'm going to get this right, because I, I know... It has only 4.5% unbelievers. It's the lowest in all of Europe. The water around Malta is called the Bay of St. Paul. Jesus Christ is preached in the public schools. What if the storm is about creating a miracle out of you? I think that we need to change prophetically the way we look at what's going on in America and recognize there's a sovereign God and the providence, as someone says, is the glove, the hand of God and the glove of history. Here's my wife, Krista.